If it's Thursday, Congress blasts TikTok CEO as he attempts to lobby lawmakers against a ban of the massively popular Chinese-owned app, following dire warnings from U.S. national security officials. Plus, new developments in two different grand jury investigations tied to former President Trump as an indictment decision still looms in Manhattan and a judge compels a key figure to testify against Trump in Washington. And fury and chaos in France as hundreds of thousands of protesters hit the Paris streets, clash with police in demonstrations nationwide. President Macron defends his move to override parliament and raise the retirement age. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I am Chuck Todd reporting in Washington, where rising concerns over the Chinese Communist government's influence inside the United States took center stage today. The CEO of the hugely popular video sharing platform TikTok testified before a House committee today for five plus hours, just two weeks after national security officials called the Chinese owned app a, quote, loaded gun pointed at the United States and as the White House considers a nationwide ban of the app altogether. The CEO, Sho Zichu, testified that the app has now amassed more than 150 million users in the United States. It's basically half the population, just under. He tried to reassure lawmakers that the company had an extensive plan to protect U.S. user data by essentially keeping it firewalled in the United States. And it claimed it would not be beholden to any foreign government. Bidens is not owned or controlled by the Chinese government. It's a private company. 60% of the company is owned by global institutional investors. 20% is owned by the founder, and 20% owned by employees around the world. The potential security, privacy, content manipulation concerns raised about TikTok are really not unique to us. Ownership is not at the core of addressing these concerns. We will firewall protected US data from unwanted foreign access. TikTok will remain a place for free expression and will not be manipulated by any government. Lawmakers appeared unconvinced by his arguments. Multiple lawmakers also flagged concerns about the app's effects on mental health. And members on both sides of the aisle told show that they remain deeply concerned by warnings from the U.S. intelligence community over potential Chinese government control of the app, its data, and perhaps most importantly, its unique algorithm. To the American people watching today, hear this, TikTok is a weapon by the Chinese Communist Party to spy on you, manipulate what you see, and exploit for future generations. I still believe that the Beijing Communist government will still control and have the ability to influence what you do. And so this idea, this Project Texas, is, is simply not acceptable. I don't believe that it is technically possible to accomplish what TikTok says it will accomplish through Project Texas. I just think that there are too, too many uh, back doors through that process to allow that to be possible. You have, in fact, been one of the few people to unite this committee, uh, members, Republicans and Democrats, uh, to be in agreement that we are frustrated with TikTok. We're upset with TikTok. Fascinating, isn't it? Uh, Congressman Cardenas is right about that one. You might not be surprised to hear that lawmakers often seem to struggle at, in this hearing to understand the technical details about how TikTok operates. But one thing we do know that Congress does understand is simply raw power. Which brings us to TikTok's fundamental argument that it would simply be too disruptive for lawmakers to take away something used by 150 million of their constituents. And according to new polling from the Washington Post, a very big chunk of the app's user base seems to understand the risks highlighted by lawmakers. A majority of them actually agree it's likely that TikTok allows the spread of false information and that the app is collecting Americans' personal data for the Chinese government. And 41% believe that it's likely the app lets Beijing control the content U.S. users see. And yet... They use the app anyway, and they use it a lot. Only 21% of TikTok users support a ban. And that number drops among younger users who are more likely to be on the platform. But think about the fact that something you use, you want to be banned. Does that tell you how addictive the platform is? One in five users are for the ban? That's astonishing if you think about it. So while users may be okay with the risks TikTok poses, clearly Washington is not. Today's hearing comes as bipartisan bills have been introduced in both the House and the Senate, and it targets technology produced by or housed in countries 
deemed adversaries of the United States. TikTok has already been banned on U.S. government devices, and many state governments have done similar restrictions. The White House recently gave the company's Chinese owners an ultimatum to divest from the app or face a nationwide ban. And despite efforts by TikTok to distance themselves from the Chinese government, Beijing has now come out against a forced sale of the company, saying any divestiture must be, quote, in accordance with Chinese laws and regulations. Talk about undermining the, the TikTok CEO's testimony today. That alone does. What happens now is a bit unclear. But based on the warnings of national security officials and the massive growth of the platform, the clear message from U.S. officials is that some kind of action is needed now. In other words, TikTok. Ali Vitali is on Capitol Hill, where the hearing just wrapped up a few minutes ago. And we're going to speak to a lawmaker that was involved in Ali, let me just start with, I, I, it was fascinating to me, because TikTok has spent, up until this week, I'd say the last six weeks, really trying to court Washington. Yeah. You know, really trying to sort of understand how it works, behind the scenes dinners and meet and yeah. greets and all of this. And then they came out guns a blaring. Okay, you want to ban us? We got 150 million customers. Good luck. 150 million customers, and then they also flew several TikTok influencers to Capitol Hill for a rally yesterday. I have to say, it was one of the biggest gatherings that we've seen in this one area of the Capitol complex where they often do press conferences about policy, and they were making an argument not around the typical things that you might think of for TikTok, which is viral dances and other cooking videos, but instead they were making arguments about how it helped them as educators, how it helped them as small business owners, trying to almost make an economics argument for it as well. They had several congressmen who were there backing them up on the idea not to ban TikTok, but nevertheless, you watched that hearing today, long, long hours for the head of that company as he faced a grilling from a very large panel of lawmakers. Part of why he was there for so long is just because of the size of mm -hmm. this committee. But you watch this rare moment of bipartisanship, and you talk about it a lot, we do, about how China is a unifying factor here, how the potential role of maybe banning TikTok is a uniting factor here. It certainly something that mm -hmm. on the House and Senate sides, I hear about it from lawmakers on both yeah. sides all the time. The question is, if they actually want to own having done that. I mean, I was talking to a lawmaker yesterday who uses the platform, who likes the platform, has a lot of followers on TikTok, says he doesn't necessarily want to stop using it. But if you give an ultimatum and you say to the Chinese government and this company, ByteDance Byte has to divest and they don't do it, then that means that you're only left with the other side of that ultimatum, which is to ban it. Political consequences be damned. So what other, I mean, how did he respond to the question of why won't they divest? Yeah, certainly that was one of the key questions here. And I think you, you nailed it in the introduction because one of the ways that he talked about it is that the problems that the lawmakers were bringing up, he says, are not questions of ownership. The idea that there could be mis- or disinformation on this platform or propaganda pushed out through it, that was one of the lines that lawmakers went down. We've had those conversations before with places like Facebook and TikTok. So the company trying to make the case here today that TikTok is not different than those other social media platforms, it doesn't matter who the owner are and who the company is that's in charge here. He was also asked at various other points if he's had contact with the Chinese government. He said not since he became the CEO of this company, but there were some pretty simple yes or no answers that he, or yes or no questions that he was asked that he didn't give simple yes or no answers no. to. And it's why a lot of these lawmakers left with more concerns than they walked in with, frankly. Uh, I think I know what some of those yes or no questions were. I've, I've, yeah. They, they struggle with some of these. They yes. really do struggle explaining the bite dance relationship. Anyway, yeah. Ali Vitale on Capitol Hill. Ali, thank you. I'm joined now by one of the lawmakers involved in today's hearing, Republican congressman from California, Jay Obernolte. And he's one of the few lawmakers in Congress with a background in tech. He was a video game developer. For all I know, he's still a video game developer, among other things. Congressman, uh, the bottom line is you actually speak the language, if you will, um, which far uh, not enough members of Congress do. So you, you heard some of the technical explanations uh, that, sh uh, the, that uh, CEO show, uh, Chu was making there. Um, anything he say give you some calm? Anything he say sort of appease you a little bit? Well, 
It, it was a very interesting interview. Uh, I thought he kept his composure pretty well the whole way through. Unfortunately, he didn't give me the answers that I wanted to hear. My questions for him were technical questions about how this so-called Project Texas, which is uh, their phrase for the effort to firewall user data in America away from mainland China, how uh, that would actually be accomplished. And from a technical perspective, I'm very skeptical that it is technically feasible to do that in a way that would be uh, that would be impossible to defeat. And uh, many of the questions that I asked him, he said, well, I'll get back to you, Congressman. So I'll look forward to seeing the, the, the written answers there. I was this the uh, committee hearing to say I'm going to get back at get back to you? I mean, he didn't have some of these answers. I mean, I'm guessing this was not your first interaction with people with TikTok because I know they've been sort of having behind the scenes. I mean, they knew the information you guys were looking for. They weren't prepared. Well, I mean, first of all, to be fair to him, he was asked hundreds of questions today. Okay. So. I think if you hear something that you weren't expecting to hear and you don't have a ready answer for, that's the default stance. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, I think that also it's, it makes you come off as very evasive when you don't have those ready answers, particularly, as you say, in a hearing where a lot of those questions can be anticipated. Uh, th there's, there's two things that have been sort of yellow flags to me. The explanation as to why, they, why divesting doesn't matter. He seemed to really believe it's divesting doesn't matter. Do you believe it, do, it doesn't matter? Uh, I don't think it doesn't matter, but I'm not sure that it completely solves the problem. And I think, you know, when we're discussing banning something that over 100 million Americans use, it's important to talk about the whys, right? We do, no one relishes taking that away from the people that enjoy using it. But the problem is that we are very concerned about the ways that social media companies, this is not unique to TikTok, but social media companies collect vast amounts of data about Americans. And they've mm -hmm. used that in combination with sophisticated artificial intelligence algorithms to make eerily accurate predictions of how that behavior is influenced. Yeah. And they can use that model to actually influence people's behavior. So that's really dangerous capability to have in hands of anyone. Uh, that includes U.S. companies, but yeah. it's particularly dangerous to have in the hands of foreign countries who right. could potentially use it to influence American opinions, which has happened in the past. We, we know it has happened. So it's not an unreasonable thing to be worried about. That has national security implications in addition to trying to protect the safety of Americans. Do you think America can regulate algorithms without knowing the algorithm? Well, I had, it's funny you, you asked this. I, I had that exact question for the chairman uh, today in the hearing. And uh, the point I was making, because part of, of uh, Project Texas is they are going to allow uh, Oracle engineers to look at their algorithms and certify that they're free from forward interference. But the problem is when you talk about artificial intelligence, the algorithm is not what matters. The algorithms are fairly simple. Uh, you know, it's the design of a neural net and the way it's trained. What matters is the data sets, these huge sets of data that right. you use to train the algorithms, and then the output that you ask out of those algorithms. And that can be changed at any time. So uh, that's the real danger here. Do you think this algorithm, you know, I had somebody say to me today, well, you know, Instagram sort of essentially is you is now doing is essentially borrowed the tic tac algorithm for how Instagram reels works. Is that your sense? Is this that or, or it, it is what TikTok's algorithm so proprietary that it do, does that it is more effective than any other algorithm out there? No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, and all of the algorithms are concerning. What's especially concerning with respect to TikTok is the possibility that uh, foreign actors could be using that algorithm to influence the opinion of Americans. But, you know, in general, Chuck, uh, this illustrates the need for comprehensive federal data privacy protections. Yes. Because, you know, this, this concern uh, is a concern with anyone that collects this much data about uh, about users yeah. and seeks to use that information to influence their behavior. So uh, I really hope that Congress this year will enact a comprehensive digital data privacy law that uh, that takes that out of the hands of the states, creates one standard yeah. for everybody, protects uh, Americans' privacy across the country to prevent this kind of data from being accumulated. Do you think there's a disclosure aspect that would be sufficient to you in lieu of a ban? So, you know, we put warning labels on cigarettes. We decided not to ban cigarettes. We decided to go with warning labels. Um, warning, TikTok, you know, when I download the app, if we had a warning label, TikTok is owned by a company that is influenced by the Chinese Communist Party. Be careful when you decide to put this on your phone. 
What say well, you? I that concretely because uh, three bills that do exactly what you just described passed out of the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House of Representatives two weeks ago. Uh, and I voted against them because uh, I'll tell you what they did. One of them created a warning label for any app that was banned on federal devices, mm -hmm. which includes TikTok. It's only TikTok right now. One of them created a warning label for any app that had data stored in the People's Republic of China. One of them created a warning label for uh, was any an app published mm -hmm. by any company that was either controlled by the PRC mm -hmm. or uh, the CPC or, or headquartered in the PRC. So uh, the reason that I voted against them is I, I'm not a big fan of government warning labels. And I think if you're going to have one, you have to be very explicit about what you're warning against and what people ought to do about it. So, for example, you know, if you're in the winter walking up some stairs, there's a sign that says, stairs may be slippery, please be careful. You know, I got it. I, I understand what you're warning me about. I understand what I'm supposed mm -hmm. to do about it. Tell me, warning, this data may store the, this app may store data in the People's Republic of China. That doesn't really give you any useful information. So you think a ban is better than doing a warning label? I mean, I because I, I go back to, I, you know, I, you know, we're all First Amendment people here. We're all sort of, we're, we're a free society. China is not. So I, I struggle with this. Do you do a ban or do you warn people of the effects uh, of, that this could do, right? Like, I guess, sure. I, ideologically, where do you fall? Well, I would certainly, you know, I'm, I'm a First Amendment guy, too. And uh, I'm a proponent of, you know, freedom and liberty. I think that, that to the extent that we can uphold those as principles, that always leads to better outcomes. So I would rather have a warning label than a ban. Uh, if you're going to have a warning label, it better be explicit about exactly the type of things that you're warning about. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, if you're going to have a ban, it's only as a last resort. Uh, but as, as I said, you know, the, the, the solution to this is not banning specific apps because uh, that's that's the problem. It's like squishing ants with your yeah. fingers, right? Yeah. If you you know there'll there'll always be another ant that sprouts up somewhere else, and you can you know uh, come up with a new someone will come out with a new app tomorrow that'll take the place of TikTok if we were to ban TikTok. So the real solution here is to get our arms around the bigger problem, which is this vast accumulation of the data of Americans that's allowing this type of manipulative behavior. Yeah, I we've all been waiting for our. Privacy Bill of Rights. It is something I remember politicians in the late 90s talking about, Congressman. And here we are 30 years later. Anyway, Congressman Obernolte, uh, Republican from California. Congressman, thank you. Appreciate it. Great to see you, Chuck. I'm joined now by Suzanne Spaulding. She's a senior Homeland Security Advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, formerly a cybersecurity expert with the Department of Homeland Security. All right, Suzanne, so um, give me some technical analysis from what you heard from TikTok CEO today. Do you think he made a decent case that the uh, American data is protected? Uh, now, I, I don't think he was a convincing, a particularly convincing witness, as your previous uh, guest uh, talked about. Uh, um, it was unfortunate that he wasn't able to give clearer answers yet. And I wonder if some of that might be that he's engaged in these negotiations with the administration. Mm -hmm to determine whether there are measures that could be in place, put, put in place to m sufficiently reduce the national security risks from this app and, uh, and is un was unwilling to have those negotiations there in front of Congress. But whatever the reason, I, I, I think it did not, it clearly did not allay yeah. uh, sufficiently the concerns that are out there. You know, we've seen to split TikTok off from the other social media companies for obvious reasons. Uh, there's a connection to the Chinese government. But all of the concerns, and this is the congressman pointed this out, um, and, and shoot, even TikTok's uh, advocates have been pointing this out. Every, every concern that we have, whether it's mental health, whether it's potentially being uh, influenced by bad actors or data privacy, is also a problem on Instagram, is also a problem on Twitter, is also a problem on Facebook. Uh, is Congress tackling this the right way right now? So it's such an important point, Todd, uh, and so much of the concerns that were expressed, particularly in today's hearing, as you say, are really concerns with respect to these uh, huge social media platforms, and they are very legitimate concerns. They are not a unique national security concerns that are related to TikTok. Um, I, I think the and and so. Congress should be taking a comprehensive approach in these data privacy laws. They mm -hmm. ought to be moving forward on those. Uh, they ought to be thinking about the ways in which competition, opening up these platforms to greater competition, could give people an opportunity to vote with their feet 
uh, and and therefore demand mm -hmm. that these platforms do a better job of addressing these kinds of concerns. Uh, but 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 they are not unique to TikTok. But there are legitimate national security concerns that are unique to TikTok. What is it? What makes TikTok different? So, yeah, so clearly one of the big things is the uh, ability for all of this data that is privacy invasive, that is, um, you know, very uh, detailed data that can be collected on all of us, uh, having that wind up in the hands of an adversary, yeah, of really the Chinese government. Uh, that may be a very real adversary at some point down the road in terms of a, an actual kinetic conflict. So, um, so that's a very legitimate concern. There's a very legitimate concern around China being able to use all of this data to improve its information operations, right? As you mm -hmm. got, as you have talked about its information, the propaganda. This is a very powerful platform. 150 million users across the country, half of half of our population that can be reached, uh, and the algorithm that allows them to specifically target. Uh, in different ways to different audiences can be a very powerful propaganda tool, and that's a legitimate concern. Where sh who should be uh, regulating algorithms? Because it's interesting to me, TikTok doesn't want to give its algorithm essentially for the government to look at. And I'm thinking, imagine if the FDA, if uh, tobacco companies told the FDA, no, we're not going to tell you how we make our cigarette filters. Um, you can uh, study our cigarette and decide from inside out, right? So. Can you do that with algorithms? So I, I think the idea of starting with uh, outside non-governmental third party researchers, for example, yeah. who would have access to this, as as you noted in, with, in, the, in the previous conversation, it's not simply a question of looking at the algorithms. It really is more complicated than that. Um, but I do think that if you gave uh, outside researchers sufficient access, they could detect if you were changing the ways in which you serve up information to people in a way that that is now serving China's propaganda interests, for example, and and that could propose with a level of of at least transparency and, and visibility and be able to quickly detect when that's happening. Look, we've got in the intel community. I'm not going to I've got to stop the segment, unfortunately, but there's all sorts of sort of public private um, boards, right? I think of the FISA, the way some FISA, there's a lot of decisions that are sometimes you bring in, quote, outside experts. This seems to fall into that category. You could easily see academic research board that sort of reports to CISA type of thing. Anyway, makes a lot of sense. Suzanne Spaulding, uh, an expert uh, uh, at uh, CSIS. Thank you so much. Good to see you. Coming up, I'm going to talk to one of the only Democratic lawmakers defending TikTok right now, even as his colleagues in Congress consider the all-out ban on the app. My one on one with Congressman Jamal Bowman next. Plus, Trump faces new developments in two grand jury investigations. As the former president's lawyers report for a hearing in Washington, just as charges are also being weighed in Manhattan. Details ahead. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. While the consensus on Capitol Hill this morning was for a crackdown on TikTok over its ties to the Chinese government, the feeling is not universal. New York Congressman Jamal Bowman told NBC News yesterday there are many apps on our phones right now that are Chinese apps. And so the idea that, oh, TikTok is the boogeyman, it's just part of a political fear mongering that is happening. Joining me now is New York Democratic Congressman Jamal Bowman. Congressman, I appreciate you coming on. So uh, let me start with the first question there. You heard from TikTok CEO. Do you think he did a good job defending the app? Or do you think you would have done a better job <laughs> defending the app? <laughs> Listen, it's tough to sit there and answer hundreds of questions about any topic, even if you are an expert. But it was good for him, him to come. It was good for him to be in the hot seat. It was good for him to answer the questions that he had to answer. But I think part of his testimony that I want to highlight and which I've been talking about all week is we're targeting TikTok for safety and security reasons, particularly national security reasons. But we're not talking about 
all of the social media mm -hmm. apps out there that have access to our data, often without our cons consent or understanding of where the data is going or how it works. And our data is now being sold, all, has always been sold to the highest bidders, both in foreign nations and here in our country. So for me, it's about having a larger conversation about the harms and benefits right. of social media and to finally work in a bipartisan way for national legislation around safety and security on all social media platforms. All right, let me ask you this. Should, why, why shouldn't the government be concerned about foreign ownership of, of companies that target Americans on the consumer level if that country is an antagonist to our way of life? So first, I haven't seen any evidence that shows me as a member of Congress that these countries have been, China or any other country, has been a bad actor in this space in this way, except Russians' interference in our 2016 election, yeah. and that happened on Facebook. And there was no conversation at that point about banning Facebook, selling Facebook, breaking up Facebook. A lot but of people deleted Facebook. <laughs> uh, correct, right? But, but still, not enough. But now we have this consistent fear-mongering, starting with the Republican Party, and now many Democrats are, are sort of catching on around China and around their access to our data. But just this overall sort of global competition with China in all its forms. And, you know, that's how Republicans govern. That's how this place works way mm -hmm. too often around fear. Let's take a step back and have a comprehensive conversation about social media, about right. addiction, about monopoly. Right about time on the apps and about safety and security of our data. So let's talk about, <laughs> excuse me, what is what is a data privacy law? How, what kind of teeth would you like to see in a data privacy law that you think would assuage many people's concerns about TikTok specifically? What could we do in a national law that would answer our TikTok concerns? First of all, what in the world is happening with my data as we speak? What are you doing with it? Where is it? Where does it go? Who is it being sold to? We need that education. Many we don't users know, right? On these platforms. We, we have no idea. I, our data is just out there somewhere, and it's being used. Everything from facial recognition software to the Catholic Church buying data from the app Grinder to search for gay priests. This was reported by the Washington Post. So all of this is happening. All of this data is out there. We have no knowledge of it. First, we need knowledge. Second, we need consent. Do I consent to you using my data in these ways or not? And if I don't, then don't use it. The problem is the, the entire advertising mm -hmm. infrastructure yeah. for Facebook and other American companies is built on this data. So if that data comes away, ad dollars come away. If those ad dollars come away, right. these companies are broke. And they've been allowed to build oligarchies over this time. Right. Uh, and now we're focused on TikTok and not talking about the others. That's unacceptable, and that's not how we should be governed. Who in the government should look at algorithms? Well, I would hope that would be my committee, the Science, Space, and Tech Committee, which ha has jurisdiction over research and development. Ironically, we currently don't have jurisdiction over the Internet, which should absolutely change, but also the Energy and Commerce Committee as well. Um, but all of government should look at algorithms because, as you know, there, there have been biases in algorithm, algorithms from a, from a racial perspective. Yep. And we also know, uh, you know, facial recognition software is something else that's being bought and sold in larger markets, bought and sold to law enforcement. There's been mistaken identities when it comes to facial recognition software and the algorithms. So uh, there are two committees on the House side that can look at this issue, but it should be a whole the government approach and my concern with president biden yeah. and the u.s senate you're, you're jumping off a cliff to ban TikTok, and we haven't even had a lot have a larger conversation right. around the understanding of how all this works what do you think happens if TikTok does get banned people just gravitate to another platform well people will gravitate to another platform or a new platform will be created mm -hmm. um that's what will happen but here's what I think we're also losing sight of. 150 million Americans are on TikTok right now. Five million businesses are on TikTok. People use TikTok to earn a living. 
150 million Americans, many of them young people, many of them tend to lean Democratic. So if the Democratic Party is a part of shutting down a platform that they have used to build community mm -hmm. and, and, and to be in a space where they are often accepted and connected with others in a space where they don't get that in face, on Facebook or, or Twitter or Instagram, it can harm us politically in 2024. But more importantly, it can harm the American people in our sense of well-being because people find space to be themselves on TikTok yeah. that they can't find somewhere else. But if there really is a national security concern, the economic argument then rings hollow, does it not? Correct. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, so if there's Chinese espionage happening on TikTok, absolutely, that trumps everything else. The problem is there's been no evidence of that, but there's been hysteria. And my point is, take a step back, look at the national security concerns of all platforms. Yeah. I mean, Donald Trump used Twitter to nurture the behavior that occurred yeah. on January 6th in a violent insurrection. That's a national security concern. Looking the other way and allowing Russia to interfere in the 2016 election, that's a national security concern. I would argue that misinformation right. and the spreading of misinformation on these platforms are a national security concern. And even more importantly, they, they, they impact the psychology of the American people yeah. in a way that's negative and harmful to us, forcing us to almost be at war with ourselves. This happens on American platforms, not yeah. just on TikTok. No, I mean, it's the important point. All the concerns about TikTok apply to every other social media company. Uh, I, I get the point you're making, and I think it rings very true to a lot of people. Congressman Jamal Bowman, Democrat from New York City, good to see you. Thanks for coming on, sharing your perspective. Thank you, sir. You got it. Up next, it's Trump versus the investigators. Former president takes aim at the DA in Manhattan, the special counsel in Washington. At least that's today's targets. Mid new developments in both of those criminal cases. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. New developments today in two of the investigations facing the former president, Donald John Trump, starting with Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg, who was firing back at House Republicans over their request that he testify about his office's criminal investigation of Donald Trump before they've even actually finished their criminal investigation of Donald Trump. In a letter obtained by NBC News, the general counsel for Bragg's office called the request by the House Judiciary and Oversight Committees unprecedented, saying, quote, the letter only came after Donald Trump created a false expectation that he would be arrested the next day, and his lawyers reportedly urged you to intervene. Neither fact is a legitimate basis for a congressional inquiry. And as grand jurors in Manhattan weigh charges tied to hush money payments, one of Mr. Trump's attorneys, Evan Corcoran, could testify before a different grand jury, this one in federal court, as early as tomorrow. That's a grand jury that's connected to special counsel Jack Smith's investigation into the classified documents that were found at Mar-a-Lago. A judge ruled this week that the Justice Department had presented sufficient evidence of Trump committing a crime through his lawyers, meaning the attorney-client privilege cannot apply to this matter. Joined now by Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel and former senior member of the Mueller investigation team. He's now an NBC News legal analyst and a professor at NYU Law. Andrew, it is good to see you. Let me start with how unprecedented is it for a judge to be willing to waive attorney-client privilege. How often does that happen? It does not happen that often. And the reason it doesn't happen that often is that you usually don't have the problem of crime fraud, which is when the government has sufficient evidence to prove that it is likely that the client is either in cahoots with the lawyer mm -hmm. or using the lawyer unwittingly to commit a crime. But it's not unheard of for this particular judge, Beryl Howell. I personally have experience with her in the Manafort case um, that emanated from the special counsel mm -hmm. Mueller investigation, where she did exactly the same thing in exactly the same circumstance, uh, where Paul Manafort had issued a letter, actually two letters, to the Department of Justice through a lawyer that had numerous false statements in them. Mm -hmm. And she ruled that the crime fraud exception applied. And she also held that it's not even covered by the attorney-client privilege. Um, this is somewhat in the weeds, Chuck. Right. But attorney-client privilege is supposed to be a protection for when you're talking to your lawyer seeking legal advice. 
But if you're just transferring to the lawyer facts to give to the Department of Justice, that's not seeking legal advice. That's just using the lawyer as a conduit. So it's not even protected by the attorney-client privilege. And that's what she held in the Manafort case. I'm confident she would have done the exact same thing here um, in, a, in a lengthy ruling. Why isn't the lawyer being charged with a crime? So it's not necessary for a crime fraud for the for the government to take the position that the lawyer is involved. To, again, to use the Manafort example, we went out of our way to indicate that the lawyer was unwitting. In other words, that the lawyer had no idea that the information that she was putting in these letters was in fact false. Now, I don't know what the government. Why did you know that for sure? I Mr. say that. Did you know that the lawyer actually tried to verify the facts? I mean. Look, as a reporter, if a source gives me bad information, and I could have verified those facts, but I chose to use that source, is it on the person who gave me bad information, or is it upon me, the reporter, who didn't go verify that? I mean, why, are, why is the lawyer here being accepted? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, I think the difference is, what is it, um, is it a question of proof? And what exactly is it that makes somebody, when you say it's, who's it on, the issue is for criminal law, you would have to show that the, um, if the client and or the lawyer knew, had, had that intent, not that they didn't check or that they were negligent or reckless, but did the lawyer know that what they were putting in the letter was false? Now, just to relate that to Mr. Corcoran, there is some indication that he may have known, because if you remember, he drafted the certification that ended up being false, but he was unwilling, apparently, to sign it. Another lawyer mm -hmm. signed it. So if I were in the government, one question I would have for Mr. Corcoran is, if you weren't really suspicious about the validity mm -hmm. of what was in that certification, why didn't you sign it? Why did Christina Bob have to sign it? And if you remember, Christina Bob um, had to repeatedly ask for sort of wiggle words, like to the best of my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so there definitely is a sense that they had doubts about what was in there. Now, whether that rises to right. the level of a criminal case yeah. is is a matter for, you know, for the Justice Department. If you were in Alvin Bragg's shoes, are you in a moment where you could get a gag order on Trump or because there's no indictment, there's no technical there's no technical reason to ask for a gag order. That's also a great question. Um, I feel like we're a little bit in law school right now, but the, the I always that treat is, you this way. You, I, you're Professor Weissman <laughs> to me, buddy. I'm not a lawyer. I have to play one on TV. That's why you're here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll tell NYU to sign you up. Please. Um, okay. So. Um, you would need to have a case uh, that is pending. And I have to say, every time that I have been in the government and I have obtained a gag order, it gen generally it works one way. Even, even though it applies to both sides, yeah. it typically is something that the government, I'm not saying the government's always flawless, but the government really tries to adhere to it. And the defense, usually there are, there are certain defendants who yeah. repeatedly violate it. Again, to go back to the Manafort situation, he was found to have, have violated it. Um, and so I do think they may, may seek that kind of order here. But, you know, good luck controlling somebody like uh, the former president uh, right. well, in controlling well, what he's going to say. Or even maybe he controls himself, but not as uh, not many of his allies. Andrew Weissman, uh, Professor Andrew Weissman from NYU Law, and of course a, <laughs> uh, of course a uh, NBC News legal analyst and former Justice Department member of the Mueller Report team. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. After the break, DeSantis de-escalates. The Florida governor and likely 2024 candidate trying to walk back his rhetoric on the war in Ukraine after facing major backlash from his own party. Panels next. Watch Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis appears to be changing his tune on Ukraine after some criticism from within his own party. In an interview that's right now still being published in print in the New York Post, it's going to air on Fox's streaming service by Piers Morgan soon, DeSantis referred to, uh, referred to Vladimir Putin as a war criminal, who he said should be held accountable for the invasion of Ukraine. DeSantis also said Ukraine has a right to the, to the land seized by Russia. 
and he called Putin's decision to invade a mistake. This is the same Ron DeSantis that referred to the conflict in Ukraine earlier this month, not that long ago, as a, simply a territorial dispute and said it was not a vital interest to the United States. Can both things be made true? Joining me now on set, Eugene Scott, senior politics reporter for Axios, Eugene Robinson, Washington Post columnist and an NBC News political analyst, and Sarah Longwell, who is friends with people named Eugene. Um, she's a publisher of the ball work. Anyway, um, Mr. Scott, I'm, I will start with you here. I think it's fascinating with DeSantis. Is this a flip-flop or not, right? To Tucker Carlson, let me put up again what he said. While the U.S. has many vital national interests, becoming further entangled in a territorial dispute between Ukraine and Russia is not one of them. To what he said to Pierce Morgan, is this a flip-flop or is this an evolution? Well, it could be either, and it also could be what some Republican lawmakers have said, that he's naive and perhaps just really is not as informed mm -hmm. on this issue, uh, you know, as he needs to be to be leading the Republican Party. I was in Florida earlier this week and talking to some voters, and some were saying that, you know, we don't really know where DeSantis stands on a lot of issues, mm -hmm. including foreign policy. And I think this situation is revealing that to those in his party as well as mm -hmm. those outside of it. Sarah, Donald Trump flip-flops on everything. <laughs> and he's flip-flopped on, like, uh, we, we made a point. I think he, in, on immigration, he flip-flopped 38 times. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. uh, John Kerry flip-flopped once on Iraq funding, right? It became yeah, a right, huge, huge deal. Huge right. deal. Yeah. Is this a big deal for DeSantis or not? Yeah, I mean, DeSantis is trying to figure out what it means to run for president and be in the national arena. And this mm -hmm. was always the question about DeSantis, right? Could he live up to the hype? I talk to voters all the, all the time in mm -hmm. focus groups, and they are sort of generally ready to move on from Trump. They're worried he's not electable, and they like Ron DeSantis. But their relationship with him is very shallow, right? They've only mm -hmm. seen him in Florida yelling at reporters, mm -hmm. yelling at kids in masks, mm -hmm. yelling at Disney. What's he going to be like when he's toe-to-toe -to -toe with Donald Trump, mm -hmm. who is another person that they like? And what is it going to be like when he realizes that there's new rules, where Donald Trump basically has no rules, can do anything, right. people will still love him, <laughs> and Ron DeSantis has to actually try to ply a trade of running for president? One of the things we've learned with Trump, Eugene, is mm -hmm. that anybody that tries to be like Trump yeah. gets held to a higher standard, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Marco exactly. Rubio tried, and he got... Uh, it exactly. just does it. All these Trump imitators... Well, don't get away with doing the things that Trump gets to. And I think DeSantis is probably sitting there going, Trump flip-flops all the time on this exactly. issue. He doesn't get hit. Exactly. But guess what? You're the governor of the, what, third most populous third. state in, yeah. the, in the country. Sorry, New York. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, New York, but Florida is yeah. ahead of you now. And, and so that is a big deal. You ought to have some opinion, some knowledge of the war in Ukraine, which is a really, really big mm -hmm. deal that does affect your state and a lot of people in mm -hmm. your state and from your state. So, uh, and it was a flip-flop. I mean, it was, that's what it was. It was a ter territorial dispute to war criminal. Yeah. That's a flip-flop. So I want to put another topic out here on DeSantis. Trump seemed to bully him into defending him from the Manhattan DA. So, Sarah, what did you... There's sort of... That's one way to look at it. Or I look at it as... He mitigated an issue, both on the Ukraine thing, calm the Republican establishment down, and trying to make sure Trump doesn't come after him anymore. Is he being smart and savvy about the Republican base, or is he showing himself that you can bully him? You can either bully him into a different position on Ukraine or bully him into attacking Alvin Bragg. Yeah, no, this is what I mean about he's learning a lesson this week, and he is getting bullied, and part of it is it's clear that he doesn't quite know who he is. He has decided on a strategy, and his strategy is to run right alongside Trump. I'm gonna have the same position on Ukraine, I'm gonna have the same position on Medicare, Social Security, and is that tenable? Because you can't out-Trump Trump. Elizabeth Warren did this a little bit, where she kind of tried to like run alongside Bernie, only to realize then, at some point, there was no lane left for her. Mm -hmm. And Ron DeSantis could find himself in that sour mm -hmm. spot as well. Eugene. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting to see uh, what what uh, DeSantis believes is the best way to wade into this particular argument. It doesn't serve him well to defend Alvin Bragg, mm -hmm. and so it, it was an easy decision for him that might not have been primarily motivated by Trump. Maybe he but came But Trump's out, people kept beating him up for not saying did. anything, and then he yeah. finally felt like... Now, I thought he was kind of snarky in how he did it. Hey, I don't know, I don't know how what, what it goes into hush that, money payments, that was, which yeah. I thought was... 
Yeah. At the mo- in the was, moment, I thought it was a little savage. That was I snarky. Yeah. But why are all the people who want to beat Donald Trump defending Donald Trump? <laughs> I mean, this is not like well, not the it's, way you're going to beat Donald Trump. What, what you know, Mike Pence, you want to be the man? Nikki you be Haley, the man? DeSantis, they're yeah. all defending him because against they want Donald supporters, Trump. right? Right. They, they want need, supporters. They need his supporters. You cannot but, beat Donald Trump without risking losing the people who love Donald. You're Trump. going to have to take some risks to right. beat Donald all Trump. Right. Yeah. What do we make of Donald <laughs> Trump's? evisceration of Ron DeSantis's record in Florida. That's the other thing. Like, what Trump will do is he will, he will create new negatives for DeSantis that DeSantis didn't know he had in Florida. Mm-hmm. That is something he can do, Sarah. Yeah, but this is why Eugene is right. He has to, DeSantis is gonna have to go at Trump. Look at what Trump is doing. Trump is going to attack DeSantis. It doesn't have to be consistent. It's nope. just going to be crazy. Yeah. It's just going to be he crazy. He has no rules. That's he doesn't right. play by a rule book. Yeah. That's and right. in fact, it's not consistent. He has called DeSantis a good governor. He said, oh, he's fine in Florida. Yeah. He's yeah. just not ready for prime now, time. Now, 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 now he's, he's a right. terrible governor. But, it, but as Sarah said, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't yeah. matter. He's, he, uh, but this is, DeSantis is going to have to figure out that he's got to go at Trump and that you know, everybody will smell the fear on him. Those voters, the voters who like DeSantis also like Trump. And if Trump continues to alpha him, and Ron DeSantis is kind of trying to do snarky things. We all enjoyed that answer on Stormy Daniels. You know who didn't like it? Trump supporters. Yeah. They want to see unequivocal support of Trump. And this is the box that these Republican candidates are going to find them in. And if they get lured into just defending Trump all the time, yeah. talking about Trump all the time, Trump will be the nominee again. I also think that attacking uh, DeSantis in Florida and decreasing his favorability ratings isn't going to be as hard for mm-hmm. Trump as some people think. Everyone talks mm-hmm. about how well DeSantis mm-hmm. is liked in Florida. Yeah. I don't think he's liked as much no. as people think. And no. he has far more critics who, once Trump comes forward and says, and yeah. remember this, they're going to go, we also don't like that about DeSantis. Speaking of likability, Joe Biden's approval numbers are going down, Gene Robinson. Mm-hmm. What do you make of that? You know, they stay in his range and we're uh, at the low range it's a low range yeah it's a low we're range in, we're in the 30s you know i mean this, i think this look, was a drop from 45 anything, they had had him at 45 they now have him at 38 okay you're right and i you know there are other polls that have him at 45 there was a rasmussen poll for what it's worth that had him you know like at 47 49 mm-hmm. something like i mean very, you know almost parody but yeah. the, but the thing is it doesn't go over 50. i have a theory sarah that that actually biden never benefits from bad news but trump it actually hurts him because people think, God, oh, I'm so tired of Trump and Biden, even though Biden does benefit when actually at the ballot box if it were Biden v. Trump. Like, in a weird way, Biden doesn't benefit from the political environment Trump creates, but he would in a one-on-one matchup. Right. He, he benefits when there's a direct contrast, right? Yes. So mm-hmm. and Democrats in general, when they are contrasted with Trumpy, election-denying extremists... At a ballot box. At a ballot yeah. box, yeah. The, yeah. the voters will go there. In general, though, day to day, voters aren't that. I saw this every time in 2022 going into this. People wanted to vote for Republicans. They just didn't want to vote for those Republicans. And they yeah. didn't love Joe Biden, uh, but they were happy to vote for Democrats because Republicans were crazy. Eugene Scott, what, how does the White House think their uh, low poll numbers, what, the, what they mean? Uh, well, I would imagine that they would argue that they haven't moved forward with implementing all of the things that they say they want to use these next two years to implement that they accomplished for mm. the past two years. And everyone I talked to on the Hill and the Democratic leadership said, just give us some time. Mm. Once we deliver for the people what we said we would deliver for, people will uh, begin to like us again. We don't know, because we also don't know that people are paying yeah. that much attention. It's possible 45 is the new 50, just like when we said 50 was the new 60. <laughs> and maybe that's where we are in a polarized time. I don't know. Anyway, uh, Eugene Scott, Eugene Robinson, not named Eugene Sarah Langwell. <laughs> Longwell, good to see you all. Thank you all. Still to come, massive demonstrations in France. It's not just Paris anymore, and it's causing major disruptions as protesters block roads, airports, terminals, train tracks, all over President Macron's new pension policy to raise the retirement age to 64. We're live in Paris next. You're watching Beat the Press now. Welcome back. Demonstrators across France took to the street for the ninth day of nationwide protests as President Macron forges ahead with reforms to the country's pension and retirement system. In Paris, tens of thousands of people gathered in the streets, voicing their frustrations with Macron's proposal to raise the retirement age from 62 to 64. According to French media, over 240 different protest events were planned throughout the country, causing disruptions to schools, public transportation, and even blocking access to the country's main airport. Macron broke his silence yesterday in his first televised interview since forcing the bill through Parliament without a vote. He said the changes were necessary to balance France's pension system in the years ahead. Joining me now is our foreign correspondent, Megan Fitzgerald, who's in Paris. So, Megan, 
Well, how does this end since the government action is over? Yeah, you know, uh, it, it, it appears as though Macron is not willing to budge. That's what he said yesterday. He said he didn't like the fact that he had to push through this pension reform bill, but he said he had to do it because the current pension plan is about to run a deficit. It's about to go bankrupt. And he hopes, he says, that the French people will eventually in the future see that he's right. He says his only regret is that he wasn't able to convince the people. And he wasn't. I mean, look at today, for example, as you yeah. mentioned, the ninth nationwide protest that we've seen some 800,000 people, yeah. according to unions, taking to the streets here. These folks are angry. They're yeah. frustrated for several reasons. One of them is the way in which Macron did this, pushing through the legislation, bypassing a vote in parliament, um, not listening to the people, as they say. Right. Uh, and they're also frustrated because, as you know, Chuck, I mean, this is a society where they value that work-life balance. Right. They work 35 hours a week. They take their vacations. They say they pay higher taxes than most European countries, and so they thought that the prize was to retire at 62. That is now being increased to 64 with Macron saying that will be the law of the land by the end of the year. Megan, is there any is there any sort of other vehicle left? Is When's the next set of, uh, of elections? Is there any other way for those upset that they can vent and change this in the next six to nine months? You know, the hope uh, among the, the protesters that we've been speaking to is that if they continue the protests and demonstrations like we saw today, that maybe Macron will crack, but it doesn't appear as though that's going to be the case. I mean, uh, Macron has already said that this is something that's absolutely necessary. But the big question is, Macron has four more years left in office. He's angered the yep. people. He's at like a 23. There's different polls out, a 28 percent approval rating. rating. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you've got the fact that he's angered members of parliament, members of its own party and he's got four more years to govern how effective will he be in those four years Chuck? well like the rest of the western world apparently as unpopular as every other democratic elected leader these days but uh i'd love to find the popular leader in the world i don't know if they exist megan fitzgerald in paris stay safe great reporting thank you and thank you all for being with us this hour i'll be back tomorrow with more meet the press now nbc news now coverage continues with hallie jackson right now Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.